This is the, this is the final day of final the, day uh, of the uh, lectureship series. series. Uh, Jeremy's done, uh, Jeremy's done a fantastic, job, fantastic job for us. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, looking forward to, looking forward to two lessons. more good lessons. You've all been wonderful, You've all been so, wonderful far. so far. Um, and then we'll um, resume back to our normal um, service tomorrow. Um, we can all say that it was well and good that we were here. So thank you all for coming out. Um, we'll sing 271, More About Jesus. We'll have one song and then we'll have opening prayer. Brother Tom Keynes will have her opening prayer. We'll have another song and then we'll ask Jeremy to give us the lesson. Um, then we'll have an intermission in between the first and second lesson. <clears throat> and then we'll have a closing prayer by your brother Mario. More about Jesus. That's all the same. More about Jesus, what I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving for the sea. More of His love who died for me. More, more of Jesus. Father, almighty and all-knowing God, we're so very thankful for all your many wonderful blessings, thankful for this time that we're assembled together to <coughs> worship you and to hear your word preached, thankful for Brother Jeremy who's come before us to preach the word of God. Help us so we can listen attentively to your word that's preached, so thankful that, that we can take in your your holy word, thankful for, for you being in such a, a wonderful God and all you many wonderful blessings for Jesus our Savior who went to the cross to die for our sins. So, so very thankful that for all the many wonderful blessings you've given us in our life, for all the, all the, the riches that we and blessings we have in this land, and for all the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. We're so thankful, God, for everything that you give us. You're such a wonderful and, and such a loving God. Thankful that uh, for the church that you've seen to give us all these things.
for this plan of salvation through our Savior Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sing 774, Beyond This Land of Parting. And we'll have a lesson this morning. Let's all sing. Beyond this land of parting. Before I start today, I just want to once again thank you guys for the opportunity to speak with you, uh, to talk to you about God's things. I'm thankful that there is a faithful group being led here uh, by the word, that you guys are interested in the gospel, that you want to share the good news with the community, with your friends and families, and uh, I'm very grateful for uh, just the chance to share in that. Uh, I'm also mindful of something that we have only started to realize at Portage, the fact that because these things get posted online, you never know how far your reach may go. And so I'm thankful that you guys are able to stream and post these things and record these things for later. And I tell you, it may be years down the road, this sermon may be heard by somebody, and it may do a lot of good. Um, so sometimes our efforts might feel small. Uh, we wonder who's listening and realize that you just never know what impact the word might have. Have you ever had a teacher tell you, now listen up, if you get just one thing from my class, I want you to pay attention to this. And I think teachers do that because they recognize, they look out over the sleepy audience, the kids, they're all distracted, they're all chitter-chattering, and they're like, wait a minute, this is the one thing that's going to be on the test, you got to know this. And they're realistic to know you're not going to remember every word they say, and so if you highlight it, you say, this is the thing. When a Bible writer says, this is the most important thing I've ever said, this is the most important thing I've ever taught, pay attention to this. And he's writing it to a, I'll call him a sleepy audience. The Corinthians, who seem to, <laughs> on every issue, kind of forget what Paul had to say. And he says, guys, this is what it's all about. Now this, this uh, whole series of lectures have been about the, summing up the story. What is the story all about? And we've kind of danced around this point. We mentioned this point, but today's sermon right now, we're going to focus on what Paul says in his words are the most important thing he ever wrote, he ever said, he ever preached. 
And this is the thing that he preached everywhere. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we learn that he leaves Timothy in every place he goes to teach the same things he taught in every church. So it's not like a separate gospel everywhere he goes. Every city got the same gospel, and it's this gospel. And if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, we will be here the whole time. In fact, I'd like if you would do that. Um, so you can check me on this stuff, and you can follow along with me. You can see it in your own Bible, in your own version. 1 Corinthians 15. Much of the beginning of the letter is answering questions. There are criticisms against some of their bad behaviors. But especially towards the end, he really wants to leave them with a strong sense of, of why are we in this? Why are we doing what we do? What is this all about? And, and by chapter 15, uh, if you just want to listen with me, starting in verse 1, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So let's talk for a minute. Uh, I told you I don't like that word gospel because I think it you know, obscures what it actually means. It means good news. There's nothing wrong with talking about the gospel, but to understand the gospel means good news. It's the good news last night we talked about uh, the, the idea that uh, we can be saved, that we can be made holy, that we can have life. All of the good aspects that go with it, we can be part of his family, we can have fellowship with God. But the good news, and it's something that was predicted in the Old Testament by every prophet, every single prophet, every single story points to Jesus. That's the good news. And it's for us. It's for every single person. We talked about how it was for the Ethiopian eunuch. It was for uh, Jew, Gentile, male, female, uh, everybody, no matter what your status. That's the good news. But notice a couple of things about it just in the verses we read. Paul preached it. Sounds simple, right? But this is what he proclaimed everywhere. We have churches across the nation that preach everything but the good news, right? They, they don't <laughs> preach the word. They don't even open the Bible. As a church, you ought to demand that the gospel be preached, the good news, from the book of good news. And if your, your preacher doesn't preach good news, you got a problem. I remember when my dad was, uh, unfortunately, he had some bad experiences as a preacher, um, but there was a congregation and one of their main complaints when they had asked him to move on was that uh, well, he had been printing out some uh, outlines for some of our mem the members that were hard, you know, they couldn't see, legally blind. Uh, they could see if it was close up and very large print. But others kind of liked to have those outlines too. But they started counting the scriptures. And they told my dad, uh, we've noticed that your average amount of scriptures per sermon has ticked up to, I uh, use too many scriptures for a lesson. And so the church that my dad was hired by afterwards they, they wanted to know, hey, we, we've got to ask, why were you fired? Why are they making you uh, leave? And my dad said, well, believe it or not, this is one accusation that I used too many scriptures. And they said, that's exactly what we're looking for. They said, our last guy, he barely, he barely read the Bible. Uh, a church ought to be in the camp of, we'd like to hear the scriptures more rather than less. And I, I believe that about the group here. But this is what Paul preached. He preached the scriptures the scriptures fulfilled in the person of Jesus. That's what we preach. We don't preach gimmicks. We don't preach jokes. We don't preach entertainment. Uh, we, we don't preach all that stuff. We preach the gospel, the good news. They received it. They had to accept it. We talked about last night. It's possible to obey or disobey the good news. Because the good news has a component, which we talked about our first night. Um, You've got a part in it, right? Everybody's got a part in it. And obedience is part of that plan. And so we either choose to receive and accept or to ignore and reject the good news once it's preached. And, and there's people that have preached the good news and they might as well have been preaching to a wall or, or, you know, it didn't get accepted. But the Corinthians were brethren. They had a lot of flaws. They had a lot of failings. But at one point, they had believed, they had received the word. They'd responded the way they were supposed to. We noticed they stood firm in it. Now, you might read 1 Corinthians and you're like, really? They stood firm in it? But to the best of their ability at the time, with what they knew, they were doing their, their very best to stand in it. Paul's correcting some errors. He's saying you got some misunderstandings. you got some behavior you got to clean up before I get there. But he called them brethren. 
Now, it's interesting, you know, in every letter except Galatians, Paul has something he's thankful for. And you might say, wait a minute, why, why would he be thankful for the Corinthians? And if you go back and look at that, do you know what he's thankful for the Corinthians? He says, I'm thankful you have everything you need to do what's right. You know, he has the belief that because they have everything that they need, that they can make the right choices. And other churches, he's like, I'm thankful of your faith. I tell everybody about it everywhere I go. That wasn't the Corinthians. <laughs> uh, see, he says, maybe I'm, I'm thankful for your, your support and your help in the work. That wasn't the Corinthians. They didn't really help him. Uh, but what he says is, you've got everything. I know you do. I spent enough time there. You've got everything you need to make your changes, and I'm confident you'll, you'll make the right choices. And I'm hopeful, by, because of 2 Corinthians, that they had started to make those changes. They still had more to do. Um, but they were going to step up and they were going to do some things better. But he also says, you'll be saved if it, saved because of it, in it, if you don't hold it in vain. When we hear the word vain or vanity, sometimes we think about someone's appearance. Um, they, they care more about superficial things, how they look, what they're wearing. Um, but vanity is more than that. It is just kind of emptiness. It is worthlessness. It is things that don't really last and matter. And certainly it can be our, our, our clothing, our outward appearance, and things like that. Um, but, but, it, but vanity, when you believe in something in vain, uh, it, it's kind of like a waste of your time, right? So it would be a waste of your time. He's going to talk about it in this chapter. It'd be a waste of your time to change your whole life for the gospel if you actually didn't believe it. Did you realize that? Now, I want everyone to be here, and I'm not ever going to say, get out of this room. I want you to hear and listen. But if you're here and you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are. If that's true, if the, Jesus didn't raise from the cross, or, or from, the, from the grave, you are kind of wasting your time. Now, I fully believe Jesus did raise from the grave, so I don't think you're wasting your time. But if your belief is something that is... is going to change you, it's going to save you, and you have a true active belief, a belief that, that changes your behavior, that's what you'll be saved in. So that's the news we're talking about today. That's why he says this is the most important thing. Read with me further. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So Paul was somebody who learned the gospel and preached it to others. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And we're going to talk about the witnesses, but he appeared to, starting with um, Cephas and the Twelve and others, he appears to many witnesses. So if you wanted to sum up the gospel in a nutshell, you know, we did it in two verses last night, but you can also do it this way. Um, the good news that in fulfillment of scriptures, what's always been predicted Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he raised again on the third day, and he, was, he appeared to many witnesses. He was seen by many witnesses. So if you want to sum up what is the good news, and that's one way to do it. Those are the most important facts. That's what makes the gospel good news. Because as we're going to see in just a few moments, if Jesus just died in a grave, and his body's out there somewhere, this isn't really good news. The good news is that he didn't stay in the ground. That there is an empty tomb. And that's something we get together as Christians every first day of the week to remember. And hopefully more than that, hopefully every day of our life, we wake up and we live differently because there's an empty tomb. And the best explanation for that empty tomb, as we've studied the facts, is that Jesus raised. But so many in the world... They either, if they believe that about Jesus, they do nothing with it. They haven't changed their lives with that fact. They'll get together on Christmas and Easter and maybe someone's birth or death, and that's the only time they ever talk about it. So they might believe it but do nothing with it, and that's worthless. Or else they say it's just a fairy tale, and they don't believe it. And they, if you don't believe it, you're definitely not going to do anything with it. You see, the facts lead to a change in the way we feel and the way we have faith and what we believe, right? The facts lead to a change in feelings and in our faith. 
and our actions. So um, I actually, at this point, I just want to call your attention to a, a book. My wife and I are teaching our middle school class at church right now. Um, and I, I hardly ever recommend a book, but it's a little book called uh, More Than a Carpenter, uh, written by Josh McDowell. There's an updated version of it because uh, I hadn't realized that the edition I had was like from the early 90s. The updated one's even better. Um, <coughs> it, it's been used before. They brought it to college campuses, and, and there's lectures on it, things like that. But we're teaching our middle schoolers about this stuff. And a lot of the things I'm talking about today are summed up well in that book. And if you have kids, uh, even younger than middle school, but middle school or above, or just for you, this is a good place to start if you want uh, to know a little more about it. One thing that's great about him is that if you want deeper resources, he's got a great bibliography in the back. And he can point you to a lot of other people, which will be further reading on this. Um, but the, the facts are that there is an empty tomb. And we have to figure out what we're going to do about it. Um, now, I'm going to read about these witnesses seeing Jesus, and then we'll talk about some of the explanations that people have given through the years about why there is an empty tomb. So if you want to keep reading with me in 1 Corinthians 15, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So before we go on to the next slide, I just want to mention a little bit about these witnesses. There are some things about this list which are significant. Uh, number one, where were the apostles whenever Jesus died on the cross? Now John and Peter followed at a distance. Peter got pretty close, but was even swearing, denying that he does not know the Savior. Uh, John followed him to the cross, even to the point where Jesus looked out and said, uh, to his mom and to John, he says, you know, behold your mother, behold your son. He entrusted the care of his mom to John the Apostle rather than his five brothers and his sisters because he has that kind of a close relationship. So John was the only one there at the cross. Um, and, and, but where were they after the, the, the crucifixion? They were behind closed doors, locked for fear of the Jews, that what just happened to Jesus would happen to them. And so he shows up to Peter, and convinces Peter. What's Peter doing? Just a couple of months later. Peter is before those same Jewish leaders that he was cowering in fear of. And he's like, I don't care if I die. Peter, James, and John, and others were in prison. In fact, it's told to us that probably everybody except John the Apostle died because of their faith. And don't think that, that John the Apostle had it easy because he died of old age. He died of old age on a prison island because of his faith. The Apostles, what would make these guys who were scared to death, who, by the way, some of them were probably teenagers at the, the very oldest, early 20s, what would cause them to go from fearful to confident, willing to give their lives? They believed they saw the risen Jesus. Who else is in this list? Notice there's a special visit to James, the Lord's brother. Why does that matter? When you see James in there, uh, people always think of James the Apostle, but he died pretty early on. Um, he wasn't really a pillar in the church. He was a martyr in the church. Uh, he didn't have a chance to become a pillar because he died. Herod killed him, uh, even in the book of Acts. He's the first apostle to die. <clears throat> but we have... James, the Lord's brother, the book of John tells us specifically that Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. In his three-year ministry, by the way, that was incredibly shameful for a rabbi. If a rabbi's own family did not support him, that was considered scandalous. It, it actually undermined his ability to be convincing to his disciples. But yet, John is not afraid to record those personal details. He's a best friend of Jesus. He knows those things. That his own brothers are like, hey, let, let's, uh, let's 
diffuse the situation. We'll go celebrate a holiday. Uh, at, at certain times, it's like, hey, you, you haven't even taken time to eat and drink and take sleep. Let's just get out of here. Let's go rest a little bit, Jesus. I mean, who knows what it was like growing up with a perfect brother, uh, but it, certainly they weren't convinced at that point. I believe Mary was. Mary was, she always treasured those things in her heart, but the brothers, they just didn't quite believe Jesus was the Son of God. But by the time of Acts chapter 2, the Lord's brothers are there with Mary and with the apostles, and they are part of that 120, we're going to talk about them in a little bit, who have gathered together because they become convinced that the Holy Spirit's going to be given to them, that it's going to be poured out, that the gospel is going to be preached, and so they are one of the faithful, including James, because there's a visit to James. I think James probably needed that visit. And that's part of the why the book of James, written by that same brother, he doesn't say a servant. Jude says the same, too, by the way. Jude's another one of Jesus' brothers. They never claimed that ancestry of Jesus. They humbled themselves and said, nope, we're just his servants. James got a personal visit. That, that brother who was unconvinced that his brother's teaching was real, he now believes. Paul ends talking about himself, right? And I think out of all the conversions, Saul's is the most dramatic. What led Saul of Tarsus, someone who was, uh, in his own words, a violent aggressor against the church, willing to drag men and women to prison, and I think even have a hand, not just in supporting their death, but putting them to death. At the very least, they were dead because he brought them to jail, and they were killed. What could cause somebody like that to change? It's funny, this past two weeks, my middle schoolers and I have been going through the class on this. The evidence for Jesus really raising, Paul is one of the best examples, the best things that can convince somebody. In fact, even the other disciples didn't believe it because it sounds so outlandish. Why would a violent aggressor now become a believer? And they didn't want to associate with him, and they didn't until Barnabas was there. In all of these cases, what convinced these people to become believers, whether it be the apostles, Lord's family, uh, the 500 that saw him at once, the, the 120, and Paul, the one untimely born in his own words? It's because they fully believed they saw the resurrected Jesus. In Paul's case, the resurrected glorified Jesus, but still, the resurrected Jesus. And there was no empty tomb, or, or, or there was an empty tomb, and there was no body in a tomb, is what I meant to say. They absolutely believed there was an empty tomb. Do you know what could have stopped their faith in an instant? You could have said, I know you really believe that, but come with me. Look, look, look right here. Gethsemane. Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Right here. So what's, what's the answer? What's the solution? Now, People have come up with all sorts of things throughout the years. Uh, some of these were actually new to me studying this. That's why I said this updated version is, uh, was a good book to read. Um, <clears throat> so the first one is just that uh, Jesus is a myth. There is no major historian on earth that says Jesus is made up. We, we literally date our time by him. <laughs> you ever think about that? And I don't care if you change it to, to BCE, it's still by the, the coming of our Lord, right? Literally, society has been changed because of Christianity. Empires and... Uh, really, the world is different because he existed. This one holds no value among any historian. Any good historian will tell you, yes, Jesus was real. Now, the debate is, who was he? And by the way, even among those calling themselves believers, there's very different stories, right? You talk to your witnesses, uh, Jehovah's Witness neighbors, and they'll say he was Michael the Archangel. You talk to a Mormon neighbor, and they'll say he's our older brother, he had a spirit body just like us, and one day we can become just like him. He was one of us who chose to be the sacrifice, and someday we can come up with the own, our own thing like that. Uh, we, we have uh, other people that think he was just a great prophet. Uh, even those of our neighbors that are uh, Muslim will, will believe, yeah, he's an honored prophet in their religion. But Jesus doesn't give you that choice. 
In John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You, you can't believe he's just a prophet or just a rabbi or just uh, an angel. In fact, uh, even in their own translation, the Jehovah's Witnesses have not changed Hebrews 1 and 2. And that is very specific, contrasting Jesus and angels. So if you, you can go in their New Living Translation to Hebrews 1 and 2 and point out, you know, some things about that. To which one of the angels did he ever say this? Well, none of them. That's the point, because Jesus is not an angel. And Hebrews 1 actually quotes from some of the Psalms that refer to the future Lord as Yahweh. They can't change that in their Bible. <laughs> you can't change every single reference to Jesus being God as hard as you try. He doesn't leave us that choice. We can't say he's just a good rabbi like the Jews do. He's just a prophet like the Muslims do. He's an angel. That he's just like us like the Mormons do. We can't say any of those things. He doesn't give us that option. Either he's real or he's fake. Either he's genuine or he's a fraud. Either he's dead or alive. There is no choice. He's certainly not a myth. People say, hey, they just went to the wrong tomb. Got some problems with that. Because, you know, the one thing that would have made his enemies so happy was to be able to say, look, we got a dead body. They could have stopped it. Christianity would have stopped right then and there. There would have been none of the rest of the Bible. The end. There are these silly videos online where they take a movie and they say, if this one plot point would have changed, the movie would have been over right then. Right? And I always get entertained by that. You realize, if this one person wouldn't have made this one mistake, the movie would have just stopped right there, two hours over with. Right? This whole movie would be done. There would be no uh, Christian revolution to the world. If you could just say, here's a dead body. So they did everything they could to make sure that body stayed safe. They rolled a giant stone. Now, it's easy to push a stone down a hill, but it's not easy to push a stone up a hill. It's in, if you've ever seen it, it goes down in a dip like that. It would take at least two strong men, perhaps more, using leverage to get that stone removed once it was put there. They also sealed it with Roman seals. If you broke those Roman seals, you were under penalty of death. They posted Roman guards. They said, don't go there. You're not going to the wrong tomb. And we're not talking a, a, an unmarked peasant grave. Yes, it fulfills prophecy that he was buried in a rich man's grave, Joseph of Arimathea, but it's also because you can't mistake this rich man in the rich man section they dig brand new tombs in a cave. You know where Joseph's tomb was. You know, you go to a cemetery today, you can find out who had money when they were buried. Right? They have these, like, flying angels all over their graves and these giant tombstones. You know who had money. And then the person who the grass grows over it, and you find it 100 years later, that's the person who didn't have any. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. You weren't going to mistake his tomb for somebody else's, especially with the Roman guards and the seal, and they had just been there. They didn't go to the wrong tomb that morning. People say, eh, he didn't raise from the dead, it was a hallucination. What we just read debunks that. Now, there's at least 15 appearances, if you, if you add them all up. You know, no one place talks about them all, but if you, if you look at the ones, at least 15, and I would say, in my opinion, probably a few more. But at least 15 times he appeared after his death. And two people don't see the same fake thing. Like we talked about on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and his friend. Twelve people don't see the same fake thing. 500 people don't see the same fake thing. Have you ever tried to get two of your kids to agree on a story? <laughs> what happened? I don't know. It just fell. It just broke. What happened? Uh, I think this happened. You know, you get two kids in a room and you don't get the same story. You get two reliable witnesses. What happened in that car accident? And they can't tell you. We don't have just two witnesses. We have 500 people at the same time they said, I saw it. He says most of them are still alive. You go interview them like Luke the doctor did. Luke the doctor went, and that was his job. He says, I'm going to go as an investigative reporter from person to person, from witness to witness, and find out what happened. You tell me. Luke and Acts are to be trusted. 
because of his method. John and Matthew were there. We can trust that. They were personal eyewitnesses guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mark, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, learned his words from Peter. But Luke interviewed everybody. And 500 people said, yep, I saw it. You can't fake that. It's no hallucination. That'd be some drug that's not yet been invented that could cause 500 people to say the same thing at exactly the same moment. Well, the oldest one in the book. Well, the apostles came at night and stole his body to perpetuate their myth. Number one, how are they going to do that? They are scared. They are hiding in a room. They're afraid I'm next. Number two, there's two trained Roman guards, and Peter is such a bad shot, he only got someone's ear when he went for a death stroke. They got two swords among them, and they ain't good at, it, at using those swords. And there'd be some kind of an aftermath. There is no way that the apostles stole the body at night. But the Romans had a stake in this. If the Romans fell asleep on their post, they could die. If the body was stolen on their charge, they could die. If they're false witnesses making up stories, they could die. In fact, I've always wondered what happened. Apparently, the, uh, the high, high uh, priests and scribes and Pharisees, they all paid him enough to tell him this fake story that that's the one that kind of perpetuated. But it makes the Romans sure look bad. And it's highly unlikely knowing the consequences of what would have happened. Who else would have stolen the body? Not the enemies. That wouldn't make any sense. Because if they could produce a body, they could end the, the rebellion right then and there. A random person? Why would you do that? And so this theory fails. <laughs> Absolutely. Here's the move body theory. Well, <clears throat> we know it was uh, getting ready to be a high holy day. And, and so they, just, they put him in a tomb real quick, just in case, uh, because we don't want to have a body hanging on the tree. The whole nation's cursed when that kind of thing happens, right? Um, by the way, Deuteronomy is very clear. You don't leave someone hanging on a cross on a Sabbath day or even overnight because that's a curse on the whole land. The whole land is to file with blood that way. Of course, the Romans did violate that pretty often, but the Jews would have a vested interest in not leaving a body on the cross all night, especially on a day like Passover. And they say, oh, well, they put a body there, but then they moved it to its proper grave later on. Once again, who moved it? This has the same problems as the stolen body theory, doesn't it? Now, this one is interesting. Uh, this is one I just learned about. So there is a Jewish tradition uh, back in the day of uh, multiple burials in the same tomb. Now, we actually see this happen in an Old Testament story that's one of my favorite that prefigures Jesus' resurrection uh, because Elisha has had his bones buried in one of these type of burials. And a couple of guys are on the run from their enemy and their friend died. They don't have time to bury him, so they toss him in this tomb. They say, we'll come back and give him a proper burial later. And the body touches the bones of Elisha and comes back to life. Cool story, right? There's not many resurrections in the Old Testament, and it's only in Elijah and Elisha's day. And so that's, that's Elisha's. He did it after he died. He still raised people. Cool stuff, prefiguring Christ. But the point is, to save space and to kind of keep your families together in a mausoleum type of thing, that they would go back about a year after the body had decomposed, they would gather all the bones together and put them in what's called an ossuary or a bone box. And they would inscribe on there the information about who was buried and interred, and you put it in your family crypt, right? And it would save a lot of money and time and expense. And so uh, they didn't have just a bunch of bodies laying around in rocky soil. You could put a bunch of them in shelves carved into the wall. Here's the problem. They didn't touch those bodies until, you know, at least about a year later. That was kind of the tradition because dead bodies stink. Remember that was the worry about Lazarus? He's been in the tomb all these days. We don't want to open that tomb because there's a stink that comes out. If you smell death, you know. They didn't open the tomb and move the bones into a box and put it somewhere else yet. That doesn't happen in three days. Interesting fact about this. You know in 1990, a bulldozer doing some construction in Palestine, you know what they unco uncovered? The ossuary of Caiaphas. <laughs> Caiaphas, the man who was dead set on putting Jesus to death, we have his bones. The enemy of Jesus. But we don't have the bones of Jesus. Because this, this theory doesn't hold water either. 
the copycat theory. This is another one. They say, well, lots of ancient myths involved resurrections. So these elements of the story were just added later by believers. You know, the biggest problem with that is the early evidence for the Bible. The earliest fragments of the book of John date to less than 50 years after John died. The John Ryland's papyri. Myths and fairy tales take generations to form. Paul Bunyan and the Big Blue Ox, uh, Davy Crockett, Johnny Appleseed, all, all of these American fairy tales and myths, they even take generations to fully form, right? And they're not even told the same way in every place. There's differing versions of the tales. But for the same version of the tale to appear immediately after his death, to be written about by eyewitnesses, and then people who personally knew those eyewitnesses, write their writings, the early church fathers. Yep, I was a disciple of someone who learned directly from John, and this is what he said. We have such early evidence that this wasn't just a myth and fairy tale borrowed from Roman and Greek and, and, and all those sorts of myths. Sure, the Egyptians talked about resurrection, but it was nothing like this. The copycat theory doesn't hold water. The truth is, there is an empty tomb, and we got to know why. What's the best explanation? The best explanation is he lives. And, and I could spend all day... Uh, the one I didn't even bother to put up here is called the swoon theory, that somehow Jesus, uh, he was passed out, but the cool air of the tomb revived him, and he uh, maybe went out a back exit or, or woke up, pushed a stone. Just... I'm not recommending you watch videos on it, but learn about what scourging is. People died often just from scourging before they made it to the cross. There is no way that man got up and was moving a stone. So the swoon theory is just garbage. I could go through all day long, all these different theories. What happened? Where's Jesus? Where's his body? They don't hold water. So why is the resurrection such good news? Now, I'm actually going to give you an outline to sum up the rest of 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not going to spend time going through it because I can't give it its proper due. But I want to talk about why it's important. You see, the Corinthians, some of them were doubting that the resurrection even happened. But he says that Jesus Christ raised as the first fruits. You know, in the end of March, I will be starting my tomato plants. Unfortunately, I won't get to eat my tomatoes. My first cherry tomato comes end of June. I know it because I know how many days it takes. I know exactly what I got to do, but I plant those seeds uh, right after St. Patrick's Day, and then I know early, or the end of June, I get to eat my cherry tomatoes. But the very first tomato tastes better than any other tomato ever will the whole year because it's the first taste. And grocery store tomatoes taste like garbage. The first fruits, that's what I want from my garden, right? But the first fruits aren't the only fruits. I'd be pretty sad if I got one cherry tomato and then they were done for the year. But the first fruits are the promise that all the other fruits on the plant are going to ripen. And then uh, about three weeks later, the big tomatoes come in. And then at the end of that, uh, then I'm going to have uh, I'm gonna raspberries, I'll have all these other things. I know the first fruit means more is coming. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was the first one to raise, never to die again. And so others will too. That's why it was goofy for these Corinthians to claim to be Christians and then say, maybe the resurrection wasn't real. No! He raised, so you can too. He said, if Christ raised from the dead, it's worth it to fight. He said, why did I fight with wild beasts at Ephesus? Why did I uh, put up with the persecution, imprisonments, beating, tortures, being stoned, shipwrecks? Why did I put up with this stuff if he didn't raise? But he did raise, so I'm going to fight. And he says, change your life, right? We understand what he says <clears throat> Uh, this is in uh, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought. Stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You know, change your life. Live accordingly. Because he raised, you can raise too, so live like it. It's worth it to fight even though it's hard. And then the next question comes up. Hey, what are we going to be like? And I don't know why, but all of the, the academic people around my age now, they have this big emphasis on exactly, they seem to almost know exactly what the body's going to be like. 
And I don't know, and maybe they go to college enough years at seminary and they think they got all the answers. I know we're going to have a body. I don't doubt it. We are going to have a body. But I also know it's going to be us, but better. It's going to be changed in some way. But I don't know a whole lot about that body, and I'm not going to claim to sit here and, and know all this stuff. I think it's arrogance to do so. They're wondering, what are we going to be like? Maybe their question is, I was buried at sea. The fish ate me. What's going to happen? I was cremated. What's going to happen? There's a certain generation that's really upset about cremation because they wonder what's going to happen. I think God made you out of dust once. He can make you out of dust again. Really? But so what does he do? What's his argument? He says, God made bodies in the heavens, sun, moon, and stars. God made bodies of the beasts and the fish. God made bodies of the plants and the trees. God's a good body maker. He'll make yours too. And he's going to give you a heavenly body, one that doesn't have flesh and blood. And for someone to come along and say, we're going to have flesh and blood and we're going to eat and we're going to get married, this kind of stuff isn't real. And I don't understand where this comes from. Yes, we're going to have a body. I get it. But we will not have flesh and blood. It'll be spirit. And I don't mean we're ghostly, disembodied beings like whatever, you know. We will be real. We will be a body. But it'll be like his body, a glorified body. Trust God. He's a good body maker. But this is where it gets even more exciting. Not just a body that doesn't get tired and sick and old, but a body that we have is going to experience victory. Because, yeah, my aches and pains that occasionally happen at my age, uh, they're not great, and they're only going to get worse. My eyesight, it's not great now. It's probably only going to get worse. My hearing, it's probably only going to get worse. But that's not really the victories that I care about, is winning over that stuff. Because it's the daily struggle against temptation and sin that bothers me. And I watch the news and I just have to turn it off because I'm sad because this world's broken. <clears throat> if Christ is raised from the dead, victory is attainable. You can beat the temptation and someday you won't be tempted anymore. I, give me a broken body if I can have a spiritual soul that is whole and is not tempted anymore, that's even better. But I'm going to get both. So this is why it is the most important thing. This is why if you hold on to it, you believe it, you stand fast in it, you can be saved. This is why the resurrection matters. And if we aren't talking about it every Sunday, we're missing the boat. And so that, to me, this is the biggest argument for why we do the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Because it, it, everything else revolves around it. We're actually going to read <clears throat> the end of 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to let Paul give us our invitation today for this lesson. We'll offer the, the proper invitation at the end of the second lesson. But notice starting in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. So if you're cremated, if you're buried at sea, it doesn't matter. You'll be raised and then changed into something different. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality, but when the perishable will have put on the imperishable, this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Death still stings, doesn't it? I went to a funeral last year. I've been to, as a kid, I probably went to more funerals than most of you have. I don't know, my dad being a preacher, funerals all the time. And I don't like funerals. I don't like the smell I don't like the environment. I don't like being there. Death still stings. I can't wait till he hands over all rule and authority to the Father because every single enemy is under his feet and is crushed. And that last enemy, the only one still sticking around is death. But he says we're going to be able to mock death and say, Death, where is your sting? You've got no sting left. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can have victory over sin absolutely because he raised. But here's the invitation. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. It's not just a bunch of facts, but these are life-changing facts, and you're different because of them if you believe them. And for the Christian who's discouraged, wondering, is it all worth it? It is. For the Christian who's tired and you wonder, should I keep going? Yes, you should. Does it pay off at the end? More than you can imagine. Your work matters. No matter how small, no matter how feeble, no matter if anyone notices or cares, he does. And you're not toiling in vain because he raised. So I I really don't know what better invitation I can give than that. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So that will conclude our our first lecture. Um, In just a few minutes, we'll have our, our second. Thanks, everybody.